Hello, I'm Pastor Jerry Abels at the Victory Church. I want to thank you for being a part of our Victory family. It's so exciting for us to be able to come into your house by way of television. Victory has two campuses. We have Victory at Camden. We have Victory at El Dorado. My son, Cricket Abels, pastors Victory El Dorado. And we're so excited. Cricket and his wife, Jennifer, have been away for a while, but they're back in the church pastoring there. And I'm so excited about this service today because you're going to be able to receive ministry right from Pastor Cricket. Let's go right into that service now with Cricket. I am. I am. I am nothing. I'm no one. I am no one. Untouchable, unwise. Unchangeable, unlovable, addicted, condemned. In my eyes, I'm nothing. But in his eyes, I am everything. I am loved. I am accepted. I am not alone. I am not alone. I'm free. I'm free. I am free. I'm nothing to this world, but I'm everything to Jesus. I am loved. I am chosen. I am wanted. I'm redeemed. I'm healed. I'm restored. I am enough. I'm baptized in his blood. I'm renewed. I'm sanctified. I'm adopted. I am a part of his family. I am his son. Yo soy su hijo. I am his daughter. I'm holy. I'm awesome in his way. I am saved. He saved me. I'm forgiven. Forgiven of all I've ever done. Of all I've ever done. I have strength because of him. I have peace in this life. And the hope of one to come. I have his spirit. And because of him, I live. I am saved. I am saved. He saved me. I'm the son of a living God. I am changing. Because I am not who I was. I'm not who I was. I'm nothing to a world, but I'm everything to my Savior. I am. I am. Who are you? So going right into it, we're going to get into our scriptures. Uh, We're going to go to 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 1. We're going to read lengthy at first this morning, which you know I hate doing. But um, we'll get through the scriptures, and then we'll get on with the thought pattern and what I feel like the Lord has sent us here to say this morning. The Bible says in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 1, it says, And the Lord said unto Samuel, How long? Now, I am a word emphasizer. When I'm reading and doing things, some words jump off pages louder than other pages do. And so if you're a word emphasizer too, we're going to stop and hit this one just for a second. The word long here is important in what we're going to share today, meaning that this is not something that just happened. This is not something that just sprung up and disappeared. This was something that was going on for a period of time. So with that thought pattern In mind, let's continue this reading. It says, And the Lord said to Samuel, How long wilt thou mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill thine horn with oil, and go, and I will send thee to Jesse the Bethlehemite. For I have provided me a king among his sons. Now for the sake of time, jump down to verse 6, and we're going to start reading there again. It says, And it came to pass when they were come that he looked on Elab, And said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, Look not on his countenance, nor on his height of stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as a man seeth. For a man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadad, and made... And, and made him pass before Samuel, and he said, Neither hath the Lord chosen this. Then Jesse said to Shammoth to pass by, and he said, Neither hath the Lord chosen this. Again Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord hath not chosen these. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Are here all thy children? And he said, There remaineth yet the youngest, and behold, he keepeth the sheep. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Send and fetch him, for I will not sit down till he come hither. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and withal of a beautiful countenance and, good, and goodly to look at. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him. 
And then Samuel took a horn, the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel arose and went to Ramoth. This morning, we're going to start in this story just for a second, and then we're going to build on it. But I want you to imagine just for a second, for some of us, it's not that great of an imagining task because a lot of us have been here, felt this, or you're right here right now feeling the same thing. Here, Jesse's family had a call and anointing by God. And the man of God was coming to anoint to change everything in their lives, in their nation's lives, and in every direction. So when Samuel showed up here, can you imagine the excitement? Can you imagine the anticipation? Can you? Well, the Bible actually says they actually were afraid and nervous of what was going to take place because they sent back word to Samuel before us. Is it going to be in peace or what are you coming for? They weren't sure. They knew it was something big. And so Samuel, or Jesse, you can imagine before Samuel got there how they got the house ready. They put everything in place. They got the table set. They pulled out the fine china. They were going to put their best foot forward. They got all the boys, made them wash behind their ears, get on their best Sunday clothes, got them all ready for the man of God to come and tell them something amazing, all except for one. And the one that they left out, they left him doing a job that nobody wanted that was obs obscure and far out of everyone's sight and out of everyone's mind. We want to build on the thought process this morning that a lot of times the enemy tries to make us feel like we're overlooked, underpaid, underappreciated, not important, not significant, and it doesn't really matter. See, we would think it was because David was the youngest, but I don't believe that's what it reads into here. I believe that David was very mature for his age. The reason why I say David was very mature for his age is because if you were going to leave anybody out there to take care of your possessions or your livelihood, you wouldn't leave anybody immature to do this. They left a responsible hand. As a matter of fact, when you read later on in the Scripture, and it gets to talking about where they sent David to go to the... Um, take the food to his brothers. The Bible says before David ever left, it says he rose early and he found a keeper to keep his sheep. He was a very responsible young man. And not only was he very responsible, David was also obviously very gifted and talented. It wasn't too big of a task for him to handle all the sheep by himself to where on a normal day, it took all the boys out there working with the oversight of the dad doing this job. But here on this day, they were, they were going to leave somebody that could handle the job. So it wasn't, that he wasn't, it wasn't that he was immature or it wasn't that he was not good at what he did. He was very good at what he did because he could handle it by himself. So what was the setup here? I believe it was a setup to try to hurt and crush the potential of the anointing that God had on his destiny and future. And probably because we look through the filter of the voices that we hear in our head when David was told, hey, you got to stay here. We're all going there. I'm sure the enemy or the voices in his head started telling him all of them things. It's because nobody wants you. Nobody appreciates you. You're not important. You don't matter. And you're not as good as everyone else. So I'm sure they knew, but the truth is the ex exact opposite. He was very responsible or they wouldn't have left him there. He was very capable or they wouldn't have left him there. But the enemy likes to take things and twist things. And when he takes things and twists things and we allow those things to embed inside of us and we take hold of them, what happens is it limits our potential. So I want to take on this thought from the eyes of David that day. If you'll turn with me to uh, Psalms 102, verse 7, we can kind of see the heart that David had here. We can see the feelings that were going through him we can hear the echo of the voices playing over and over in his head. It says in Psalms 102, verse 7, it says, I lie awake, and I am like a sparrow alone on the housetop. Now, his heart is speaking here from what he's feeling, what he's thinking, and what he's going through. He said, I'm alone. I want you to understand something. Loneliness is real. Rejection is real. Those feelings and those thoughts and those emotions that come against us and try to crush us or press us down. I'm not belittling them at all this morning. I'm telling you, 
they're real. The feeling of insignificance and the feeling of unimportance that you're sitting there going through and you're feeling this morning, they're absolutely real. But I want to challenge them this morning by telling you this. They're absolutely not true. If we look over in the New Testament, Matthew chapter 10, verse 29, David said, I'm alone and I'm a sparrow. Here in Matthew 10, verse 29, says this, Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing? One translation calls that farthing one, gold, one copper coin. One translation says, Are not two sparrows sold for one copper coin? And not one of them shall fall to the ground without your father knowing. But the very hairs of your head are numbered. Fear not. If you're an emphasizer, underline the fear. Because this is the secret and this is the principle. Fear not, therefore, you are more valuable than many sparrows. Whosoever shall confess me before men, him I shall confess before my father which is in heaven. Now, looking at the economical system here in the Bible, Jesus' thought pattern and laying out the scenario, Jesus sitting here talking, obviously in the workplace or in the marketplace in Bible days, I picture a street vendor, I picture an open market where people are out there trying to sell their goods, and here we find a man that sells sparrows. And the sparrows that here sell here, I don't know if they were live in a cage. I don't know if they were shish kebobbed on a stick. But I know the value and the price of them because it says, are not two sparrows worth one copper coin? So it tells me two sparrows are worth one copper coin. Now let's go over to Luke chapter 12, verse 6. It says, are not five sparrows sold for Two farthing. Another translation. Are not five sparrows sold for two copper coins? And not one of them is forgotten before God. But even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not. It's here again. Therefore, ye are more valuable than many sparrows. Also I say unto you, Whosoever shall confess me before men, him shall I, shall the Son of Man, also confess before the angels of the Lord. Now, if you're a mathematician, which I am not, but even since I am not, this still doesn't make sense to me. In Matthew, there are two birds for one penny, but in Luke, there are five birds for two. Mathematics don't work up here. Because it should have been, in our thinking, in our mathematics, should have been two birds for one penny and four birds for two. Is y'all's math like my math? I'm here to tell you, though, our math is not God's math. His math never makes sense. That's why the Scripture says one will put a 1,000 to flight, two will put 10,000. God's economical and mathematical system is so different than our economic and mathematical system. But in this story here, it tells the story of to a merchant or to a businessman or to a marketplace person, here, two sparrows are worth a penny, four sparrows are worth two penny, and obviously one sparrow is worth nothing. In other words, sparrow, that fifth sparrow is so invaluable, he's willing to get you to buy the four, and he'll throw in the fifth. Making you think you're getting a good deal, but in his mind and in his mentality, that one is worthless to him because he's willing to just give it away. I'm here to share this morning the mentality and the thought pattern that every single one is important to God. We're going to look at it through the eyes for just a minute as David looked. When he looked in a mirror and he looked into himself, he said this, I am as a sparrow alone. Truth and fact of the matter is this. You may be here this morning and your situation may have isolated you. What you're going through, you may be the only one going through it. What's happening around you is specifically individually your circumstances. I understand that. 
And the truth of the matter is this. In God's eye, you are a sparrow. But there are no worthless sparrows in God's eyes. God said, are not many sparrows important to me? So important to God that he never takes his eyes off a single one. You know, you can imagine God's schedule and how busy he is. You can imagine just answering my prayers and going through my circumstances, not much less yours, how busy he would have to be at work all the time. But his word here promises even to this, that he never misses a sparrow's funeral. The insignificant and smallest details of your life God is so involved in and concerned about that he wants to be able to have the door open to be able to work through and use you in ways that you have no idea or no imagine. But the voice of the enemy is this. You're a sparrow. And you're not like other sparrows. Four sparrows are valuable. But when you look in the mirror and you look at yourself and you look at your situation, there's no value that you see. Or even maybe in your family members or at the job or at work or people you know or in this community, you may think because you hear what the merchant of this society is saying, saying that you're invaluable and I'm just willing to just stick you in the mix just to be able to do the others. That is the voice of the enemy. And we're going to combat this this morning. Let's look at the sparrow for a few minutes. Sparrows are little birds and they're kind of um, plain, I guess is the best way to say it. They're not like the peacock and they're not like the parrot. You know what I'm saying? They're not colorful and beautiful. They're brown and earthy colors to where if the sparrow was sitting on the ground or in a branch, you could probably hear it, but you would have to search out to try to find it. The, bear, the sparrow is just not that flamboyant and spottable. The sparrow is a little bird that, um, you know what I'm saying? It's not like the eagle and the um, hawks that, you know, are magnificent and fight with fierce passion. They're just what you would say, plain little birds. And see, the enemy wants to convince us that plain Janes are not as important as David's and Daniel's. But you got to think about it and understand God's thought pattern on things. When God chooses things, he always chooses from the end of the line. David Seven brothers paraded before him. There was the peacocks, and there were the parrots, and there were the eagles, and there were the hawks. But God said, no, 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 no. It wasn't until the sparrow come walking down the line that God said, see, that's what I've been waiting for. The sparrow is the one that God's eyes are on, the Bible says. The plain Jane. There is no plain Jane in God's system. When God chose to choose vehicles to use in the Bible, when on the day that he was celebrated the very most, the day that more people stood on the side of the road shouting his praise and glorifying the king on Palm Sunday in the Bible on what they call the triumphant entry, he could have went and got a white stallion. He could have went and got a chariot. He probably could have got his hands on an elephant if he wanted to at that time. But the Bible says he specifically sent his disciples out to find a young, unbroken donkey. Why does God use plain? Because it's never about the ride. It's always about the rider. And so what God tries to do, he tries to find somebody that won't draw attention to anything else but him. And when the Holy Spirit comes and rests upon them, they're able to turn around and say, you know what? It's not me, it's him. Just like the Bible says there about David. It says, and when the anointing hit him, from that day forward, his life changed. He began to be anointed. I want you to know something. God picks from the back of the line because he's looking for somebody that will give him the credit, will give him the glory, and will give him the praise because they know there's absolutely no good in me. So if you're here this morning, the enemy's saying there's nothing special about you, you're exactly the one God's ready to put a hold to, get a hold of, and begin to use to do great things. Next thing we want to look at for just a minute is the, a sparrow is a small bird. They're not big. You know, there are lots of big birds I was watching a thing about condors the other day, and the, the length and the span of their um, wingspan is so amazing to the point where, you know what I'm saying, when they fly over, they cast a shadow so big on the ground it scares predators and preys away from them. It's amazing. 
But the sparrow's not that way. The sparrow's a little bird. But see, when God designs and plans and makes, what God designs and plans and makes, the philosophy in the Scripture is this. Dynamite comes in small packages. And although a sparrow may be looked at from people's point of view as little, the smallest, not very powerful, not very strong, not very, God looks at the sparrow and says, hey, I'm about to do something amazing right there. The Bible says this in Luke. It says that Jesus one day was walking into a city, wanting in his desire to change that city's heart toward him. And as he was coming into the city, the Bible says a huge crowd of people gathered all around the streets just to watch him come down. And you know every one of them standing there saying, pick me, pick me, pick me. Because I figure the rumor of Jesus before had gotten out about how he just walked out and started picking people out of fishing boats or picking people out of tax collector's tables thinking, you know, they were going to be used in a great and mighty way. And so when he was walking down this city, all the people lined up and he walked by the dignitaries and he walked by the priests and he he walked by the people that were dressed just right and had the right physical abilities. But again, in David or in Samuel, it said he looks on the heart. The Bible says he walked past all the tall, all the powerful, all the big people. But it says when he came to the spot, I love how it says the spot because that the word there rec- uh, identifies to divine appointment. God specifically had a plan walking to that very spot. And it says when he got to the spot, he looked up and saw Zacchaeus in a tree. The smallest, the most uncapable, the most crooked, the one that had done the most people wrong, the one that had made the most mistakes, the one that had hurt more feelings and damaged more families, the one that had the biggest limitations, the one that had the biggest disabilities. God said, hey, come down here because I'm going to your house today. Out of everyone else, he said, I want the smallest because he knew the only one in that city that was going to be able to turn the heart of that city toward God by the end of that day was going to be the smallest that people thought, but God knew it was the greatest. The Bible says by the time that day was over, Zacchaeus stood up out of his house. He went out and he made every wrong right. He paid back double what he had stolen. And it says the city had turned their heart toward God out of a small package. I'll tell you, the enemy would love for sparrows to think you can't do nothing. You are so small. You are so insignificant. You don't really matter. I'm telling you, you are what God has been waiting and designed for. There is a divine appointment in this city. There is a divine appointment in your family. There is a divine moment in time for this church and you sitting in it to do something that people never would have dreamed of you doing because God keeps his eyes on the sparrows. Sparrows are very insignificant birds. What I mean by that is this. You know, unless you're a bird watcher or a bird spotter, when you walk out and you see a flock of Geese, you say, oh, look at those geese. When you walk out and you see an eagle, y'all check out that eagle. When you see a hawk, hey, guys, look at that hawk. But when you see a sparrow, what do you usually say? Hey, there's a bird. (laughs) Very insignificant. Birds are birds. There's a lot of times we, when you notice a sparrow, you don't even realize that it's a sparrow. It gets the name the bird. The enemy tries to sell us the bill of goods of this. God can't use insignificant. And so the enemy tries to make us think that we're insignificant, that we don't matter, that what about us can't make a difference. In the Bible, there was a young man named Gideon that had bought that bill of goods. The Bible says the Lord showed up one day in a wine press while he was pressing grain and said, Gideon, I want to use you. He said, oh, no, angel, you can't use me because... My family is the littlest family of the littlest tribe. I am the most insignificant person that anyone and everyone will let me know it. As a matter of fact, if you're even looking for me, you can't find me because I'm not where you 
think I should be. If, I, if you thought, say you went to my house and knocked on the door and said, hey, where's Gideon? They would say, well, he's out pressing grain. You would think, go to the grain press. But you won't even find me where I'm at right now. I'm so insignificant. But that angel looked at him and said, everything in your life, everything in your situation, everything about you has told you you're insignificant. But I'm here to tell you, you are a mighty man of God, and you are a mighty, valiant warrior. You need God's help today? I know I do every day in my life, but, every, but some days are more important than others. Some situations are more drastic than others. If you're in one of those situations where you desperately need the Lord to help you, why don't we pray about that? Why don't we first ask the Lord to forgive us? Maybe our first step that the Holy Spirit is doing is drawing us to Jesus. Maybe you've prayed and maybe you have faith and believe, but you've never really accepted Jesus as the Lord of your life. Would you just say, Father, I need to give my heart to you. Lord Jesus, I come to you and I receive you as my Lord and my Savior. And Father, I ask that you would forgive me for my sin. And I ask you, Lord, to do a work in me to forever change me for the glory of God. Write my name down in heaven, Lord. If you never come to the Lord, then that was an important decision. Because now your name, if you prayed that prayer, if you believe that God has saved you, then your name is written in heaven. There is a remembrance book over the commitment that you have made. You know, it's important so many times that we confirm what God's done for us. And the Bible says, let every word be established in the mouth of two or three witnesses. It's just important that we come into agreement. Why don't you call that number on the bottom of your screen and let us be a part of your agreement team. Just call that number and just say, I pray with Brother Jerry and I believe in God. I just need somebody to believe with me. And let us be a part of your believing team. Or maybe you need to call and say, you know, today I gave my heart to the Lord. I'm ready for God to work miracles in my life. We will not pry. We want to be a part of your family to help you, to support you, and continue to believe with you. Call that number at the bottom of the screen. Take advantage of our website. Give us your prayer request. Take advantage of that church out. You will be able to listen at series in their entirety. Listen to the very speakers that we have at Victory. We have a whole preaching, teaching team to help people in the Lord. Be a part. God bless you. This is Pastor Jerry Abels thanking you. See you again soon. Hi, I'm Pastor Jerry Abels. Thanks for watching Victory today. Victory is a church that's all about people, all about excitement, all about what God's doing in your life. We want to invite you back to watch each week for another exciting time together. To find out more about Victory, give us a call and let us know how we can be a part of your family. God bless you and thank you for watching the program today.